live portion. Here we go to start. We're live now. People can actually see us and, and hear us. Of course, mostly what they'll see is this big uh, screen sharing <laughs> window or, or the countdown window, I should say. And, uh, but they'll see the tiny little picture of each of us, just like I believe you're probably seeing on your screen. Okay, time to start. Here we go. There okay. goes the countdown clock. So what that means is that notices now go out to, oh, there's about 12,000 viewers who have signed up for these notices. So, so they'll, the ones who are interested, will start to come online. Okay. And uh, so this is sort of like the pre-show show. Right. I do those too. They're very short on my show. I just basically I'll start recording. We start talking. And when I go to edit later, if we say something fun or interesting, which we try to do before the show starts, it's just kind of a hello, nice to see you, you know, welcome them in and, and shake hands and all that. And that's that's I call it pre-show banter. <laughs> yeah, that that's what this is. And um so and then in 10 minutes we'll start formally. Um, would you like to make an opening statement of any kind? We well, could talk. Go ahead. Just, you know, maybe just to thank everyone and, and uh, state a couple of things, because I looked at some of the comments and uh, some of them are um, slightly inaccurate, but I don't, I don't usually go on, um, on public forums and, and uh, <laughs> discuss things with people unless there's a really, really like important reason, like somebody has said something libelous or whatever, then I might, but usually I, I leave it. And then um, in an interview, I'll say what my answer to those things were like, um, you know, people thought I was saying that people imagined UFOs and I, I wasn't saying that at all. So right. Right. like that. I, I know occasionally viewers will totally misinterpret. And, and I imagine it's because they watched maybe five minutes and took it out of context. Yeah, uh, th that happens all the time. It happens on my show. I try, I try to get people to reiterate things in the in the you know context of having a conversation. But you know, what do you mean by that? If I think there's something that could be misconstrued, but it it, it always happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was trying to find the link for this so I could send it to a couple of friends that wanted it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Would here. you like the link, or do you have it? I have it now. Okay. Yeah, let me just send it. To, I'm going to send it to my um, my tarot card group, the one that's developing the cards. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, we've Go already got uh, 60 people online, and more and more are joining all the time. I imagine by the time we're ready to start, we'll have uh, hundreds. And uh, nice. I wouldn't be surprised if, if it, the number goes up into the thousands based on uh, your earlier interview. Yeah, I think I think it had a, a follow on too, where people were watching the other interviews, too, as as mm -hmm. it, normally they might not have if they hadn't uh, been hooked in with the government one. Hopefully they were interested in the other ones, too. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a lot of comments are already coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, volunteers select the best of those comments. They'll be posting them to me on a separate document. I'll uh, select the best of those comments to read to you. So okay. mostly what we'll be doing is just answering questions from the viewers. That's fine. Yeah, I'd like to. Mm -hmm. Q&As are always great because the people will ask things. You're like, wow, nobody ever asked me that before. I never thought of it in that way. Sometimes yeah. it forces me to rethink what I'm doing or what an opinion or something, which is always good. Yeah, we typically get lots of really good questions. Okay. Oh, the artist, uh, Miguel, Miguel Romero, my artist is um, for, the, for the project, is watching. Okay. Wonderful. I've, the, the tarot card project. Yeah, maybe we can, um, oh gosh, it's a, if I had thought about it, 
a little sooner. Well, I could I, I could scan one of your tarot cards and then share my screen or something so the viewers can see them. When will they be out? Uh, we're planning sometime in October, November right now, but it, you know it depends on lots of things. But that I I gave myself uh myself and especially the group a huge huge amount of wiggle room. So we made a we said we said fall 2022. So that's anywhere between probably end of September and <laughs> end of November. <laughs> so that's when we plan to have them uh, done uh, in addition to the book. Well, and you could say that it's a big leap from your interest in UFOs to your interest in tarot cards. Well, I did have that interest from um, way back in the 1990s. I actually went through a course with the builders of the Adidam people in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I had friends that were in there. So I took their course and I, I guess I made, you know, um, what's it called? Neophyte status or something. I just got to the first yeah. level, but it was a um, heavy... Um, course and by mail too because there was no internet yet mm -hmm. um it was a mail course and even though the their headquarters was 10 miles away from me it was a, a, a mail a mail-in course where they would send you lessons and and um uh, and and questions and answers and assign us essays and all that and at the end of the thing when they thought you were ready they gave you a uh like a test you know like a written test and you had to send that in too it was an essay test oh and, and then I got a letter back a couple of weeks later. Congratula congratulations, Freighter Greg, you have achieved the whatever. But I learned a lot in that course. And plus, through a lot of my friends that were involved. How in interesting. Yeah. Hmm? I, I remember studying uh, their book. Yeah, Paul Foster Case's book. I think it's called The Keys to the Tarot or something like that. He wrote a few books on on uh, esotericism and tarot and you know he was part of that foment in the 1920s 30s or whatever of all the religion yeah. in LA and I think um, you know Manly Palmer Hall showed up in LA at about that time too that's right mm -hmm. so and that place both those places are still going strong the Philosophical Research Society and BOTA mm -hmm. so and they both have buildings BOTA is a little bit more modest but it does have a it does have a kind of a chapel meeting room in it and i went to a few of the services there and it was <laughs> it's basically people people giving lectures about each of the tarot cards or oh. relationships between them or you know their relationship to the tree of life or something like that i used to be very actively involved in the philosophical research society mm. What, what years was I, think I, I was actively involved, I would say, for maybe 30 years from uh, roughly speaking 1985 to about uh, 2015. Okay, yeah, I've been down there a few times and I've seen lectures there by various people, and um, it's uh, it's a and the library is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the lectures we were allowed to see uh, cases um, personal library that they wouldn't put out there. It was in a vault oh. building. So they opened the vault. We were looking at, you know, first printings of Blavatsky books and things like that. Oh my. Yeah. It was pretty amazing to see some of these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll be starting up in two minutes. Okay. Um, Cases um, personal library that they wouldn't put out there. It was in a vault mm -hmm. um, building. So they opened the vault. We were looking at, you know, first printings of Blavatsky books and things like that. Oh, my. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was pretty amazing to see some oh, of these wait, things. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I got a clue. <laughs> that was, you were working on it. I wasn't going to panic. <laughs> yeah, that was the YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, I've got that turned off right now, and I got my phone silenced mm -hmm. in a whole bit. Good. All right. All right. Well... Um, so we're all set to go. In uh, approximately one minute. And then the um, video will be archived and, and will be available as one of our regular archive videos. So 
Okay. Typically, you know, in the next 36, 48 hours, they get many thousands of viewers. Okay, good. I hope people go and look at my books and see if they <laughs> buy them because it's a really nice introduction. I talk about it. This is how I discover people a lot. You see them on a podcast here in the interview and half of my recommendations come from that and the other half come from friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's just about time to uh, begin the regular program. There we go. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I'm here with Greg Bishop. Our topic today is UFOs and beyond. Welcome, Greg. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I know many questions are already coming in, but um, I think it would be appropriate for you if, if you'd like to make an opening statement. I know we were both very positively surprised by the huge number of people who have been viewing your very first interview on New Thinking Aloud on UFOs in the U.S. government. Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit beforehand. And I thought, um, well, you put great, um, you title it perfectly because that's a subject that's going on right now. So anybody searches keywords, bang, it's going to come up near the top of their list or at least in their list. Yeah. So I think that's that that contributed to a lot of it. It's just the atmosphere right now. If we talked about it, you know, what three or four years ago, wouldn't have been the wouldn't have been the same uh, uh, reaction. Uh, and I wrote the book, the book that we talked about in that interview in two thousand. It was released in two thousand five, so it's been around for a while. It's just that every time something goes on with a you know with a government connection with UFOs. Um, it seems like somebody will have me on to talk about it or it'll be referenced or something like that. And I'm sure you get that with your, your books too. Whenever something gets hot for a little while, suddenly your people are asking you about it. Um, so uh, after a while, I was got tired of answering questions about it because people would ask me the same questions, especially some hosts would ask me a question and I wouldn't answer it the way they liked, so they would keep asking me the question. I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to answer what, the, what, what you want to hear, but this is what happened, and this is what I recall, and I think this is what was in the book. And doing that book was a very, it was like going to college, it was like taking a college-level course in just how these things happen, what the motivations of the government are, what the motivations of UFO researchers are, which I suppose I would know a little bit better. Um uh, one of the people that I consulted for the book, I was talking to them about it recently, and um, and they said, because uh, I was saying, well, people don't understand, and they don't understand this part of the book, and he said a very um, uh, insightful thing. He says, UFO researchers always think it's about them. It's not. There's a there's a there's a huge <laughs> there's a huge machinery in the government and especially in the intelligence community, working all the time to figure out what their advantages might be. And one of the advantages is to engage with UFO researchers to do what they need to do, which is either keep a secret or misdirect people or whatever. And while that's fair game in the international spy community, um, ethical or not, um, it is, uh, it's something that a lot of people that do the research into the UFO community uh, um, subject as it relates to the government, forget about um, the the motivation for the for the people releasing this information might, might not be to give you more information about UFOs, but to direct your attention about UFOs, and it's a very powerful meme and it's a very powerful thing that is uh, people uh, believe very deeply and, and strongly. And so, if you know what somebody's beliefs are and where they lie and how strong they are, you can um, uh, affect their perception. Um, which is, I think, what happens, um, which is fine, but you just have to be aware that it's going on. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, if I get emotional about it, I figure I'm going to stop losing perspective. And so I try, I mean, there's things I know that are wrong and that I disagree with and things that happened to Paul Benowitz and the way they did it, which were immoral, wrong, and should probably be prosecuted. But if I get emotionally involved with getting, um, thinking I can do something about it, or announce that to everybody or whatever, I think I will lose my perspective in what might be going on. And um, I mean, I like having that perspective. I like to be, even though I do have feelings about a lot of these things, I try to be as neutral as possible so that the information channels stay open. 
Because once you have a belief system or a, a very strong opinion of something, you start shutting out <laughs> alternate viewpoints or, or new information. And that, that's, that's what, um, so that's what guides me the most is trying to stay neutral and trying to be um, kind of a non-believer in that uh, um, Robert Anton Wilson way about just not believing in, uh, you know, not, not, being, uh, not being trapped in a belief system. Which he, which he, which he abbreviated BS, which is wonderful. <laughs> well, I imagine that many people tuned into that video because they suspect that the U.S. government knows much, much more than it is revealing, and they they were hoping maybe to learn more about that from you. Well, I. I think what I offer is a perspective of how that machinery works at a very, you know, at a kind of a superficial level for them. I mean, for most people, it's kind of a little bit more than that. But, you know, I understand, I try to understand the motivations. But um, uh, I think, you know, as far as the government's concerned, I think some people in the government know more than others. Um, some people that know more of these things may be in a position to do something about it. Uh, but I also think that it's a huge bureaucracy. Um, it has a, and the, the people involved in it, in, in these uh, military encounters, they're military people. They're going to look at everything as a military issue. That's just the way it is. If you're, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So um, their, th their knowledge extends to what might these be? You know, are they a threat? Can we exploit them? And then if you want to go deeper with that, maybe they do have some artifacts or who knows what. But personally, I haven't seen anything to make me think that the U.S. government as a whole knows much more than UFO researchers do. In fact, a lot of UFO researchers have, I think, probably a much better view of the phenomenon than than some, than say a, a colonel or a general or you know a, a CIA person might, because they look at the the, the um, issue from a, a different point of view and probably more different points of view than that military person might. Like the military person might care not care about how people are affected psychologically, but a good UFO researcher will care about that, and that that fills in more pieces of the puzzle. I think so. Yeah, I think they do more do more do know more than us, but probably know more than us data wise, not why, um, where, where does the phenomenon come from? What causes it, which is my biggest question. Um, and what intelligence might be behind it, which I think, you know, there's another, I think one of the comments said that I don't think there's UFOs or aliens or whatever. It's like, I, I didn't say that. What I said was, I'm not exactly sure where it comes from, but I do know that there, it's there. I do know that there's intelligence behind it. I'm, I'm, almost 100% certain of those two things. Can't be 100% certain of anything, really, except maybe moral questions. Okay, well, we'll start to take questions from the viewers. Here's one from a viewer whose YouTube name is Times One, or X One. Mm -hmm. And he, he asked, what do you think about UFOs acting like a photon, being both a wave and a particle, uh, like a quantum hologram, and, and he's suggesting a, a paraphysical craft. Uh, that part is actually, he said on what interests me the most. Um, yeah, it could be a wave or a particle. I think it can be what the observer um, perceives it to be. Uh, now, whatever that thing is, I'm not sure, but our, our senses and our uh, memories and even to some extent our photographic and scientific instruments pick these things up. But I don't think they're the same thing every time. I think they come from the same source, whatever is causing the UFO thing, but they, um, they change uh, it, because of environment, because of observers, because of, and in, in that way, it's very much like uh, a, a quantum physics experiment um, where, where light is a wave and a particle at the same time or neither or both. Um, I think that's how UFOs operate. And I think the only time and the only way we'll be able to understand it as a, as a species, as a society, is when our view of reality changes. Because we're, we're right now we're um, still in 
um, kind of an Aristotelian 19th century, maybe early 20th century view of physics and, and the universe and nature. And that's how that works. But UFOs stand outside of that. Psychic functioning stands outside of that. And, um, you know, and even moving into things like uh, crypto cryptids and religious miracles and all that. I think those things come from a place of reality, but I think they stand outside what we accept as a physical reality now. Whereas if you were from, you know, uh, India or, you know, a uh, indigenous tribe in South America or an Aborigine in, in, in uh, Australia, these things are, uh, these occurrences are just part of what is and what is the natural world and are not weird and they're integrated into their worldview. And I think at the, uh, some point in the future, we will integrate these things into our worldview. In the case of UFOs, I'm not sure though, it might change to adapt to our understanding and go somewhere we don't even expect. I mean, I, I've, got, I've got a really strong intuition about that too, that we'll never really be able to answer it, but we may be able to integrate it and deal with it in the way that a lot of UFO um, witnesses do. So, some are able to integrate it and deal with it and, and uh, live a normal life generally, and other people can't. And those are the ones that uh, need the attention and need the help so that they can. And in a way that they understand it themselves, not in, in a forced understanding. Um, and that's a tough one, I think, for a lot of uh, researchers and mental health professionals. But there are some that are quite sympathetic. And um, I think those, those are the people that help uh, UFO witnesses the most to integrate. Now, as far as integrating our entire society about this, we're at the, we might be at the very bare beginnings of just realizing that maybe that there's other ways to look at this. There's been so many theories about UFOs and opinions about them in the last couple of years that I thought nobody ever pay attention to um, as of, you know, 10 years ago. But now it's it seems like there's a flowering. And I hope it continues. I think a multiplicity of um, viewpoints is the best thing we can do about this, about this issue, because it's it appears in so many guises. And if, if we accept that, maybe we can find out what the source might be. What, what is, what's the initiating you know, um, uh, mechanism or, or you know, energy or whatever it might be? If we can figure out how, it, how it's uh, processed through our, our nervous systems and our instruments and our, our, our viewpoints and all that, and kind of strip that away or look at how that machine works, maybe we can figure out what's powering that machine, you know, the UFO uh, uh, enigma, the UFO issue itself. Here's a question from William Riteco, who says, Whitley Strieber had mentioned he and his wife, Anne, both believed that the abduction phenomenon had something to do with the deceased. Do you agree with this? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of imagery of... Um, of the world ending and death and all that. But the other thing in, in abductions, but the, the main thing is that um, I think when you leave your body, if you, uh, if you believe that you leave your body and the soul survives bodily death, um, that, that whatever that uh, soul energy source, consciousness, whatever you call it, is freed up to inhabit the world or the area or the dimension or whatever you want to call it that UFO entities might come from or um, fairies or elves or uh, many other paranormal things because it, I think it, if you're trapped in a physical body, you can only see things one way. <laughs> you can only, you can only get, get things coming through your senses. If you're very lucky, if you're a holy person or meditate a lot, you might be able to get some view or some truths or um, that uh, through altered states. Um, but, you know, <laughs> Death is a very permanent altered state. So I think that um, the perspective you might get if you do survive bodily death does include where UFOs might come from or whatever intelligence controls that, uh, controls the enigma, where they reside. Um, I think the other thing Whitley said, which I thought was interesting, and we discussed it on the show, was that um, he says the visitors are... Uh, they envy us our, our physicality because they don't, they can't feel things and they can't feel love and they can't, you know, be amazed by a sunset or any, anything like that. And also um, what he says is that uh, since they are not bound by time, which supposedly happens when you're, when you, when you uh, have physical death, 
that they also have they know everything that's going to happen and everything that has happened and it's just a big it's a block it's not it's not a linear thing and that they actually envy humans not knowing what the future is that to them is exciting and you know whatever you believe about whitley or about that opinion i think it's a really nice metaphor for what might be happening um and that's that's kind of how i look at it it's uh it's uh yeah it, it connected to the dead in in very very um fundamental ways and as I mentioned on your show, my friend Josh Kutchin just wrote a book about it, uh, which will be coming out very soon. Uh, very, very complete interview. Him. Yeah, I think it'd be a good idea because he's he's done some really heavy research. To, you, you know, Ann Streber says this, and then you know, um, Josh writes an entire you know three four hundred page book on it, and um, and he you know through all cultures all times and just d discusses how is how is the subject of death related to ufos and the rest of the paranormal he goes through each thing he goes through any kind of you know what you know what is bigfoot if you consider it uh, something that, that that inhabits sometimes the realm of the dead what what are fairies what are you know any anything um and looks at it from that perspective but which i don't think has been done yet in fact i'm pretty sure hasn't been done yet no, it looked like a very exciting book. Uh, I did see the outline. So we've got a question here from uh, a viewer whose internet name is, or YouTube name is Fringe Wizard, who asks, what is the best way to summon a UFO? The best way to do it is the way that works for you. And the only way to find that out is to start experimenting and i think it can be done i don't know what happens when you do it uh some people summon them and get a i, I think you know, almost a full-on abduction type thing and other people summon them and they just see lights in the sky um but i've heard way too many stories of from people i trust where something happened when they were uh trying to get a um uh trying to summon as you say a ufo i tried it jeff um, I used a method that um, uh, my, my late friend Jeremy Vaney told me. In fact, I was doing it right in this very, this house that I'm in now. Um, I went and sat out in the backyard and I just concentrated on having something happen. And I asked Jeff, I said, how long does this usually take? He said, a couple of days if you do it right. And what he told me, and if you want to try this at home, kids, go right ahead. But what he told me was... Um, Meditate on what you would like to see or what kind of contact you might want and then imagine it happening and then just keep thinking about that for a while. So what happened to me was nothing really exciting and it could have been an insect. I don't know. But I started hearing this extremely high pitched, like almost out of the range of hearing um, clicking noise. And it was behind me. And so I turned my head and as soon as I turned my head, it stopped. And then when I turned my head away, it started again. And I turned and I started experimenting. It's like, is this thing no when I turn my head? <laughs> and at some point, I actually realized if I went past, I think like a 45 degree angle of turning my head, it would stop. So I could only hear this high pitched noise when it was directly behind me with, within about that much, which was strange in itself. I'm there might be something in nature that does that. I have no idea, but that's what happened to me. So Maybe I got something. Um, it's something I can't explain, but other people obviously have reported, you know, like I said, full on abductions or uh, close encounter cases or, or even just lights in the sky or maybe structured craft. But it's um, I think it's possible uh, in the same way occultists have been manifesting things. And, you, you know, you can be very basic about it and say, I want to manifest, uh, you know, wealth or something. Well, if you do it the right way. Um, it just seems to work that way. Um, I think the other thing that Jeremy told me was uh, what, what I mentioned before is, is actually important. He said, um, imagine it happening. And that's a very, very old occult uh, thing. I mean, and, and it's, it, it's, you know, it's in the public sphere as uh, it's not a cult at all, but it's, a, it's an old occult uh, idea, which is just imagine something happening you, in the future, but you just have to get there. It already exists. Um, so that's kind of what I was doing with the, um, with uh, trying to do the summoning that uh, Jeremy told me about. So yeah, it, it, I, I believe it does work and call me crazy. <laughs> and uh, if people go on the uh, 
listings page for the New Thinking Aloud channel, you'll see an uh, interview with uh, Joseph Burks, who uh, received training in summoning UFOs from uh, the guy who's all over the place, whose name is on the tip of my tongue. The doctor. David Greer? Yes, yes, Stephen Greer. Yeah. Greer is problematic, but his methods, I think, are sound, some of them. Yeah, and, and Joseph Burks describes his experience doing that. We have a question from Rugops, that's his YouTube name or her YouTube name, who says, I'd love to know if Gregory has any information about either the, quote, Galactic Federation of Light or, quote, the Planetary Liberation Organization. No, I don't. The only Federation of Light I know of is the, um, and I'm sorry, uh, is um, uh, Unarius Society in San Diego, who I, who I have a special place in my heart for. They're, they're a um, contactee organization that's been around since the 1950s, and the, the, both leaders have passed on, but they have a, um, their, their, uh, their form of galactic government is the universal they're, oh, actually, I think it, when they have their meetings, at the, it's the Universal Conclave of Light. That was the, uh, and they have a Federation of Light too, I think. I'm pretty sure, but oh, as for day, present day beliefs about that, I, I'm not clear on it right now. Okay. We've got a question from Andre Slavos Krasowski, who asks, how many UFO, ufologists, in your opinion, are staunch materialists who reject psychic phenomena. Do you think it's just a small percentage or maybe a larger percentage of ufologists? I wouldn't know. Um, I would guess from just a straw poll of people I know that they're open to or believe in psychic functioning, but as far as UFOs go, they're materialist. Um, and then there are a precious few who are not strictly materialist about it. Um, and I think, you know, there's a very specific reason for that. It's because materialism is, is the, is basically kind of the religion of our, our society right now, because we've gotten wonderful things with it. Like what we're, the things we're talking on right now are wonderful examples of materialism. Um, going to the moon, um, you know, going, getting in a jet and going somewhere and talking to your friend across the world. Those are all wonderful things that come from materialism. But, um, because of that, people are, a lot of people are um, enchanted by that illusion that materialism will cover everything, or at least our version of materialism. And I think that while it's important, and it's, uh, you know, it's like the two sides of your brain, one side of your brain figures everything out and calculates and all that. And the other side is involved with intuition and emotion and feeling. And, and I think that's what we're dealing with here. And if you only look at one side of that equation, if you only look at the left brain part of uh, UFO, UFO, the UFO issue, you're going to miss all the right brain stuff, which I believe is equally as important. And because most people don't pay attention to it, probably more important right now till we get a balance. Um, and uh, I've had people say, well, why are you against data collection and photos and all that? I said, I'm not. <laughs> Go full speed ahead with that. But I don't think it's going to be the entire explanation because um, the... If a, uh, I've said this before, if I was an artist and I could do what a UFO does to a witness, I'd be the most famous artist in history. It ch it'll change somebody's life in, you know, in five minutes. Um, there's, there's almost nothing else that can do that. Uh, and that, to me, that makes it a, a very important thing that does not reside in the material all the time, or at least all of its effects are not uh, explained by a materialist model. Um, so yeah, I, I just call for a more balanced part, a balanced part of the UFO brain, I think. <laughs> okay, here's a question from Cyber, Cyber Unato, who asks, how does the UFO phenomenon relate to the Fermi paradox? They seem to contradict each other. You better explain what the Fermi paradox is because some of our viewers won't know. Uh, the Fermi paradox is <clears throat> the idea that there are so many, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jeff, but the idea that there are so many civilizations 
throughout the galaxy that we should have seen some sort of uh, evidence of it by now. Um, and people, uh, UFO uh, researchers, they always say, well, we have seen evidence of it. They're here, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're on this planet. Um, but there's a giant leap of logic there for most people um, that they assume because something is unknown that it's coming from another planet. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's, you know, if it's something that's been here with us for a while or something that's, um, uh, as I said before, and we've, you know, uh, I'm uh, attracted to that. It's something that resides in some place that is not time and space bound. Um, it may have a source somewhere that, you know, a physical source where, you know, <laughs> that's where it began. But I think that the UFO enigma comes from some place that's neither time nor space bound. And so, we, we, we have to assign a materialist uh, idea to it. Uh, and that's that's probably a mistake. Uh, what was the question again? I, I don't well, even know. If at all. Yeah, the question has to do with the oh, paradox. The yeah. And, yeah. And I suppose if, if UFOs are so common, why don't they use radio or television the way we do? Yeah, I, it's that's another. I think that's another assumption people make that is wrong because you're assuming that something that is has intelligence has it in the same way that we do, um, and communicates in the same way that we do, and interacts with us and and whatever those things are the way that we do. It's extremely likely that it doesn't, um, and that maybe some of these. Uh, I've heard this too from various people. Some of these uh, attempts at communication are just kind of like they're symbolic. You know what? I, I think a friend of mine said there's a lot of mimicry involved in uh, UFO encounters where something will mimic what the person's doing. That's what that's what you do when you're trying to communicate with somebody. You mimic what they're doing to try and start a dialogue. And I think that um, if uh, in, in that context, if UFOs are appearing to us in the way that we think that they're appearing to us, maybe it's an attempt to mimic what we what makes sense to us. You know what I mean? And that uh, that. Uh, you know, maybe it's not, it's uh, the Fermi paradox in that case is not a, um, it's, it's not even a paradox. It's just, it's just assuming things come from other planets. And I, I, I don't assume that at all. If I had had an, an encounter and the entities had told me they came from another planet, I'm not even sure if I'd believe that. <laughs> even though it's a very powerful thing to, to believe when something hap like that happens to you. So it's, I don't think there's a paradox. I think there's something here. It's just not appearing in the way that we think it should. And it's not appearing in a way that would be something from another planet, unless it was, you know, uh, had, had traveled here and, you know, and it was no deal for big deal for them to travel here, which there are theories behind that. I had a guy, Kevin Knuth on my show about a year ago, and he was talking about faster than light travel. Um, and, um, his explanation because of the, Einstein, because of, uh, uh, um, uh, Einstein's uh, idea about uh, time dilation is that if you could travel close to the speed of light or at the speed of light, time for you would be different. Like you could leave for a week and come back, but everybody that you knew would be dead because you had been traveling at near the speed of light and come back. Now, I don't know if that's physically possible right now, but if you could. So it is possible, I think, for other, other civilizations to visit us. It's just that if you're dealing with classical physics the way it is right now, um, they would basically have to be a spacefaring civilization and never go back to their home planet because a week after they left, everybody they knew would be dead. Um, well, assuming they have a normal lifespan. And if you did it for a month, it would be, you know, a million years will have passed. Your, your planet might not even be there anymore. So if there are things uh, going to and fro, I think they're just going to and fro to different uh, star systems or stars or, you know, whatever you want to call it, maybe even different galaxies, but the, they're primarily space-based, if you want to say that the that UFOs are coming from space, which it could be. I'm not throwing the, the extraterrestrial hypothesis out. It's not uh, not off the table at all. It's just one of many. And it's also, for me, almost the least interesting. Well, speaking of a completely different way of looking at it, Synapsid Digital asks, if you have any thoughts about the ET and sacred plant connection, yeah, in the late 90s, I read um, uh, DMT, The Spirit, Mo Spirit Molecule by Rick Strassman, which I'm, who I'm sure you've had on. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that really affected me deeply because if you don't know that book, what um, Dr. Strassman did at, uh, I think uh, in Albuquerque, he did this. Um, he got a bunch of volunteers and got uh, approval from the, uh, the drug, uh, you know, the DEA to administer um, dimethyltryptamine, which is a very powerful uh, psychedelic drug, uh, intravenously or no, in, intermuscularly, he would uh, inject it in muscle. Um, and then he would have people sit with them to record what they saw and what they said, because I think he was looking at this as a, as a therapeutic tool. Um, but what he discovered, and he said in the book, which I thought was amazing. He said, I really, really didn't want to deal with this and I didn't want to talk about it, but I have to because it happened. Maybe Jeff can correct me. He said at least in a third of the cases. And what happened was that people reported um, seeing entities that were communicating with them. And in a lot of cases, they were entities that looked like grays or, or reptilians or mantids or whatever. Um, some people talk about DMT and the self-transforming machine elf thing that uh, Terrence McKenna talks about. And people had that, but they also had these, they said these strange beings that would um, talk to them and do things to them. And basically it sounded exactly like an abduction uh, in a lot of, in a lot of uh, salient points. And, you know, to me, that was amazing. It's, and I think it's almost at this, this time, maybe even more evidence that whatever's going on inhabits uh, some place that's neither time nor space bound, but you can access it either naturally through an encounter like that. Um, I mean, an encounter like people will have or artificially through um, uh, uh, psychedelic uh, drugs like DMT, especially DMT. Uh, and uh, then, like I said, through meditation and through summoning or whatever you want to call it. But all these methods are actually, they've actually been used to, you know, see things differently not just UFOs for a long time. So maybe it does allow you access to that area where the dead reside. Who knows? I'm not sure if people on DMT said they saw dead relatives, um, but I would not be surprised. And DMT is uh, apparently quite a bit different than, than other psychedelic drugs. It comes on very fast. It's already in your brain. I think it's just an overload of it causes the psychedelic trip, but it's, um, it's unique, I think, in being almost consistently connected to uh, the alien thing, the UFO enigma. Okay, and I've got another question here from Arthur Scargill, who asks, is it just a coincidence that UFO chatter seems to increase at times like 1947, the 50s, the 70s, the 90s, and now when the US and Russia are at the very height of their antagonism? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's uh, curious at all. I think that, you know, and I've talked with friends about this, that um, during periods of uh, high um, stress uh, or an, an initiating, you know, um, event or announcement during a period of high stress that people will, um, that the, the UFO uh, enigma, the UFO, I'm sorry, the UFO um um, whatever causes it seems to get excited or, or we open a door and we can see more of it. Um, you know, in the fifth, in the 1940s, it was probably Kenneth Arnold, obviously. And a few of the things that came after him in the 1950s, the cold war was going on. Obviously people were on high alert and a lot of people were looking to the skies. Also, there were probably secret weapons and balloons and things like that too. And with more people looking up for these things, more things are going to be noticed no matter what they are. Um, in the 70s, it was probably Close Encounters, the movie. I think that, um, it, you know, if you're a skeptic, you say, well, everybody's thinking about UFOs, so they're misidentifying things. But you can come from the other end, as, as, the, as our friend that um, put out the question here is saying that, you know, maybe, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe we cause it in some way by, by our mindset. And I, th I think that's, uh, I think that's, um, the, uh, it is a relevant and um, something... A, a relevant uh, uh, a, a relevant issue, and I think something that um, uh, somebody could do a really good study on that a PhD dissertation on you know when do UFO waves happen and how do they affect. I think this recent one was just was almost artificially created just by the the New York Times article in two thousand what was it seventeen, um, 
and then the later ones after that by uh, Ralph Blumenthal, Leslie Keen, and a few other people. So that, I think that this wave was has been artificially created, which doesn't make it any different. I mean, I think the end the interest level has just gone up, which is good. You know, I, I think that more more, <laughs> more brains and and more attention paid to the subject will just mean a lot greater variety of 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 good information. Well, bad information too, but that always happens. But there's so many uh, new and uh, um, uh, unique minds working a problem right now and thinking about it. I think it, we're in a place that I've never seen before. I've never seen so much serious attention paid to this through media and academia and all that. And it, it's it's exciting right now. I'm, I'm glad I'm here to witness it and sort of be involved in it to some extent. Oh, I can't hear you, Jeff. There, I, I muted myself. Okay. I have a I have a question from Godly Moose, who says, yes. even if there's an intelligence behind UFOs, how much, if at all, does he, do you think it may be reactionary, something like a, a program performing an action? That could be. It would have to be a really sophisticated program if we're looking at it as a programming language or a program or something that is automatic. Um, and it may be, but it may just be the AI on it, as we would call it, it'd be so intelligent and so ready to engage with us that we wouldn't know the difference. And at that point, maybe there isn't any difference. Um, but, uh, it, uh, so repeat the question again. I'm sorry. Well, oh, okay. The question is, I'll repeat it exactly. Sorry. How much of it does... I think you got it, uh, actually. Do you think it's uh, the intelligence is simply reacting to us like a computer program? Yeah, I think it, it does react to us. Um, and I do actually think in some cases it tries to get us to react in a certain way, which was what to me shows an intelligence um, rather than a you know than an, uh, some just kind of dead program but like i said some programs could be you know if you look at uh, uh um you know the idea of a of a artificial reality or a created reality or whatever it may be so attuned to who we are and what we do and all that that it doesn't really you know it doesn't really make any difference that is the reality of it it's, as far as we would be concerned it was it would be a thinking um, entity with uh, with all the things we ascribe to a thinking intelligent entity, which is fine. I mean, it, why was it put there? Um, if it's artificial, then probably somebody put it there. Um, unless it just developed, you know, the intelligence developed as a kind of thing that just mimics. Um, who knows? Or, or or tries to get a, a reaction out of us. Like I said, it's a it's a. I think these are all attempts at communication, and we're just looking at them you know, as uh, that there is a message that there is something that's um, uh, something more behind it than just uh, attempts at communication. And even attempts at communication can be, you know, information heavy as well. So, you know, this interaction to me uh, between humans or whatever this intelligence is, um, if, we assign, if we assign a model to it, we are stuck in that model. And I, as far as UFO is concerned, once you get stuck in a model, you, you, um, that's all you see. The UFO enigma will tell you, will show you anything you want to, uh, <laughs> to uh, uphold your, whatever your belief system is. It's really good at that, or we're really good at doing that. I think it's, you know, it's a combination of the two. At, at the beginning of the video I did for our tarot project, the first thing I put up was the UFO is a Rorschach blot, which I really believe. And it, it everybody that comes into it brings their, their bit uh, into it because it, it's just it's a medium that you can apply anything you want to and it will make sense and you have to be aware of that when you when you get involved here's a question from michelle classen merrigan do you have evidence of the u.s government or others displaying advanced technologies that confuse all of the uh, ufo investigations um, probably, but like I said before, I don't know if it's intentional. I don't think, um, whatever intelligence is behind it is there to confuse us. It's there to try to communicate or at least show us something. 
and the confusion comes in with with um, humans trying to interpret it. And then a huge amount of confusion comes in when you start looking at what um, entities like the uh, a, a private company or a government or a UFO uh, um, uh, research uh, group or whatever are telling you what it is. I think that's that's more of where that message and the, and the confusion comes from. And I think the way to avoid that confusion is to stop believing in any of these things and just look at all of them, you know, uh, equally for what for whatever you can get out of them. Because ultimately, because this is such a um, such a Rorschach blot, is the meaning that you're going to get out of it is personal. And if you can come to a personal understanding of it, or at least a, a place in your curiosity where you don't mind that you don't know the answer. Um, that's probably the best attitude to have. It's a, it's a, it, it, attempts at confusing people work really well if they really want an answer. <laughs> and if, if you're not interested in such in a concrete answer, it's very hard to confuse you, I think. Okay, well, I get the impression that our viewers are looking for answers. So. <laughs> <laughs> the answer for the UFO thing comes from within and it comes from a, a deep study of it talking to people about it. There's not, you know, the only reality I can see behind it is something's going on and there's an intelligence behind it. Past that, I'm not sure. And all these things are very interesting to me, but I don't think any of them provide a hundred percent answer. Um, well, here's an interesting question things. from Stephanie Ramirez. She asks you, is there anything truly alien in the universe? Are we not made from the same elements. Yeah, I, I, I think we only think of things in the other because that's how our brains work. It works in dichotomies. It works in positive or negative or good or bad or, or love or hate or whatever. And um, yeah, we are all made of the same stuff. And I always go back to that. Um, I don't know if it came from Alan Watts, but his idea that uh, he, he said, if there are rocks, look out, because someday they're gonna, rocks are going to be walking around and, and communicating and talking. It's an inherent property of matter. Consciousness is an inherent property of matter. I think that's what he was trying to say. If you, if you, so given the right conditions, a bunch of rocks will be eventually us talking in this, in, in this forum right now and exchanging information. So I agree with Stephanie. And here's a question from Avi Cohen. Do you believe that humans with their technology can prevent aliens with their probably more advanced technology from disclosing their existence and how that project or projects on the theory of the phenomenon? Let's let's forget the last part because it's not doesn't make sense to me. But uh, okay. can in other words, are we able to prevent these aliens from making some sort of a, a massive disclosure? No, I don't think we are at all. We can't prevent it at all. And the reason they haven't is I go back to Whitley's thing. Is it? It's you know whatever it is, is trying to contact us and explain everything to us in the most democratic way possible, individually, one by one. Because we have so many different ideas about what the world is and how it should be run and you know, what, um, you know, what kind of government should be used, all these things, that it would be very difficult to tell everybody at the same thing at the same time. Because everybody would, you know, they would cling to whatever they, the meaning they think it is. And if it comes from the bottom up, that's different. I, you know, I, I think if there is an intelligence behind this, and there is, that its way of communicating with us would be to find out which, how each of us interact with something that's unknown or something that, that is them, or if we're even amenable to it or can perceive it. Um, because, uh, throwing whatever that reality might be, which I think is completely unexplainable in a conventional way, throwing all of that at people at, at, at once, it would be, it would almost be, if people could see what the reality of it was, they wouldn't understand. It would make no sense to them. Um, it'd probably make no sense to me either, just to see the entirety of whatever the UFO thing is, where it comes from, all that. Those might be the, you know, 
we're asking all the wrong questions. And if it, if it presents us with an answer that doesn't have anything to do with our questions, it won't make any sense to us. So, you know, I always go back to the individual and the individual perception. Um, and the, the, one more thing, the main reason I do that, and I think I talked about this on your show, was that if two people have had a UFO experience and they meet for the first time, even though the experience is completely different, in, in its details, they both know that they've had an experience of that. And they both know that they've had a UFO experience and they can, you know, that connection happens immediately. And uh, to me, that's more, you know, it's more evidence that this is a very individual thing and that you must come to your own truth about it. Now, when you come to your own truth about it, you'll realize that the other people have come to their own truth about it know what you know, and they feel what you feel, even though the details are different. Here's a question from Reynold Fisticuffs, who asks, what is the connection between our subconscious and the phenomenon? Why does it talk in symbolism to us? Uh, it communicates in symbolism because I, because that transcends language. Uh, language is a, is a, has a huge signal to noise ratio, depending on the language you're using. Um, symbols do not. Symbols allow for interpretation. Symbols allow for um, a direct communication to your, you know, to your subconscious. And, you know, that's, this is why I think people like Jeff Kripal and, and, and Diana Pasolka and people that are doing work with religion as it relates to the UFO enigma are, um, are on a, a very important and right track. It's because that if something communicates in symbols and, in, and symbols that make sense to us, um, uh, that means that uh, there, there's a communication there, but it's, it's, in, it's in a way that makes sense to us rather than trying to explain it. It's like, it's like somebody has a near death experience. They come back and they say, well, I, I, I can explain to you what happened in plain words, but it's not going to, it's not going to tell you exactly what happened to me. There's absolutely no way to tell you what happened to me in plain language and just using words. And so I think that communicating with symbolism and in symbols and in archetypes or whatever you want to call them has a lot more information, rich um, uh, potential for it. And if I was gonna, if I was coming from somewhere else, and I didn't know the language, if I could hold up little signs with things on them to get a message across, I'd do it. And those signs might be these symbols that we're talking about. Here's another fascinating question from Blue Shift Special Projects, mm -hmm. who asks, "What is your thought on USO, unidentified submerged objects, and underwater?" UAPs. Is what we're seeing in our skies the same objects we're seeing in and around our oceans? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that the these things are trans, what's it called, transmedium uh, capable. Um, and if you're going through the air at a certain, you know, UFOs will move through the air at way faster than uh, 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 speed of sound, which means there should be sonic booms, and there's not. So somehow the air is, doesn't have to get out of the way of them. It's just not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a factor. Um, so either they figured a way to get the air to move around the, the craft so that it doesn't cause a sonic boom, or it just doesn't exist in a, it doesn't use the physics we understand to do what it needs to do. Um, and the same with under, under, you know, un, unidentified submerged objects as well. It goes, it, the medium is, I don't know how many, I don't know how many hundreds of times more dense than air. But according to um, reports that have come out and uh, from the Navy and all that, it, they, they move through the water with almost the same speed as they move through the air. And that's a, that's a tall order. I mean, it, it, to get water out of the way going that fast, it would be virtually impossible with, with the physics we have now, um, unless you could figure some way to get the water out of the way <laughs> as, as it, as it um, before the craft gets there. So uh yeah i don't think they're um they're they're subject to the, the laws of physics as we know but they are uh that that's why it's also important to look at them um as psychic objects as well as physical objects 
and is related to the idea that they are actually psychic objects, Truth Seeker asks whether, well, the way the question is read, written is you're sure the mind is not being controlled? That is, uh, mm -hmm. to what extent is, is this really the product, product of some sort of mind control? Um, I think the mind control comes in in the interpretation of it. Um, the bare phenomenon itself. Uh, I know uh, Jacques Vallée said it controls our perception of it. And I think that's true, but I also think that we are perfectly capable of controlling our own perceptions given something that we don't have any uh, idea of where it comes from. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm not an experiencer, I'm not an abductee. Um, many of them have told me, well, yes, the aliens can tell us what we want to see and um, show us what they want us to see. Um, but, it, you know, it's still communication. It's still something that's going on. So I think that question comes from a place of, well, what's really going on? What is, what is the phenomenon stripped bare so that we don't have this illusion presented to us, given to us by the phenomenon or whatever? Since we can't really help it, I mean, <laughs> we can't really, uh, we can't do anything about it. It's probably best to see what those illusions might be if they are illusions. And if they're illusions as we know them, I don't know. Um, I'm sure it's not what it is. I'm sure whatever we see as a UFO or as an alien is not physically what that thing is. Um, or Well, it's physically what that thing is in our space. But um, where it comes from, I think, is different than, than we would think of somebody being born and growing up and being embodied in a physical body and all that. that, that that's our view of it. So, um, you know, it's almost like, well, they may be mind controlling us, but it's like, if you think that, that's all we have to work with. And you have to, you know, you have to consider either um, play the game or don't, you know. Um, as I said about the, uh, about the government, I, one of the things I wrote was the... Um, and this came from Bill Moore. He said, you, uh, the UFO research, he said, you play the game or you, you or, 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 or you don't, or you get nothing. So if you want to, if you want to risk being fooled or, um, whatever by aliens, then either do it or don't. Cause if you do, you're going to have to figure out how it relates to you. And if you don't, well then fine. You, you don't have to worry about that, 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 uh, conundrum. It's just, it, you, it, it, Basically, to me, you just have to go in without a uh, without an agenda and 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 see how it see how how the cards fall for you. But yeah, if you don't play the game, you you get nothing. You have to you have to sit at the table. Otherwise, you can't play the game. So, sitting at the table is a big step. Here's a related question from Michelle Classen Merrigan. I think this is second question from Michelle, who says. What is the best question to ask then? If the answer isn't the goal and the question is more important, what question should we be asking? People are wondering. Yeah, well, the first question that I think is most important is where does the, what causes UFO reports? Because that strips away, where do UFOs come from? Who are they? What are the aliens? What causes the report? What causes the, you know, what is that source? Because there is an initiating source or energy or physicality or something like that. But what causes that? That's the first question. And the second question, which to me, which is just as important, is why are you interested? If you can find out why you're interested, what, what is in it for you, what answers you might want, um, if you do want an answer, those things, everything else flows from that. You know, what, why, why are you interested? That, that's the reason why we did the tarot cards, really, is that we're working on um, that have to do with ufology. We want people to figure out what their motivations are, because if you can figure out what your motivations are and what you're interested in, you can start to dig and you can start to research and you can start to talk to people and you can start to do whatever you need to do to get the answers that you need. Um you know, that, that's, that's my answer. I'm, I'm just on a quest. I don't care if I ever find an answer because all the questions are so interesting and all the issues that they bring up are so interesting and all the people I meet are so interesting and exciting. So that to me is an answer. Now, if I ever find out what UFOs are, or where they come from, to me, that's icing on the cake. So, I mean, I'm, I, 
I'm sorry if I don't give a very specific answer, like UFOs are aliens coming from other planets, or UFOs are um, a government uh, uh, plot, or UFOs are, you know, a uh, psychic manifestation of, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in corporeal entities or whatever. I think they're all those things. But what part of that is most interesting to you? What part of it do you think you can find answers to? Go for that. And then, there, you know, if you find out what your motivations are, when your passion is about it, then you will find an answer. And if you don't find a concrete answer, at least you'll have a hell of a lot of fun looking for it. Okay, Aaron has a question. Uh, what are the best books to read about UFOs? Ah, it really depends on what you're interested in. If you've never read any, um, I'm trying to think of some. There's really foundational ones. I mean, any, anything by Jacques Vallée, um, you know, uh, Passport to Magonia is a good one. <clears throat> um, I'm a big fan of John Keel. So um, Operation Trojan Horse is a very good one. Um, and any of Hynek's books, like The UFO Experience, which I think he co-wrote with um, uh, Vallée. That's a good introduction. Um, you notice I'm naming all these classic books that came out basically before 1980. Uh, but I think people need a foundation in that before they move on. Um, uh, certainly Communion by Whitley Strieber. That's, a, that's one, you know, uh, viewpoint of the phenomenon, which I think is, is uh, important to know about. Um, and if you, if you have the patience <laughs> and can find a copy, it might, I think the best UFO book is the UFO Encyclopedia by Jerome Clark. Everything ever to do with UFOs is in that. I mean, at least up to about 1980 or 85 is in that is in that uh, in that two volume set. Um, what else? I'm trying to think of others that are very important. Uh, uh, Greg Little's books. He has one called The Archetype Experience. It's not quite completely about UFOs, but is very relevant. Um, wow. I haven't read any UFO books in a while. I mean, I'm reading some right now, but it's not uh, the, the the classic foundational ones. Uh, the, those are the ones I've mentioned. I'm, I sure, I'm, I'm sure there's more. Um, I know there are. There's there's tons more. But it depends on your you know it depends on your interest. Um, even uh, uh, Dolan's first uh, Richard Dolan's first book you know, uh, about uh, UFOs in the national security state, the first two books. Those, those are uh, good ones to read too for a good foundation in um, UFOs in the government. So yeah, keep asking around. Also there's lists online, people have their favorite books, but those would be the uh, probably most important ones to me coming from different points of view, paraphysical, uh, psychic, um, um, uh, actually you know, quite physical, and then you know a view of the history of it. and. Uh, um, and how this is not a new thing. Passport to Magonia does that. It helps you realize this has been going on for hundreds and probably thousands of years in different guises. And I, that's, uh, that's a very basic uh, um, tenet of what I think about UFOs. They've just been here forever. They've just been called different things. I've got a comment from Arthur Scargill, who wants to say he absolutely loves Greg Bishop He's not sure I'd, he'd still be in this scene without you. And his signed copy of It Defies Language, your book, is one of his favorite objects. So I thought I'd share that with you. Thank you, Arthur. And now we've got a question from somebody called Balloon Slash Drone. <laughs> what are your thoughts, and I don't even know what this is, on the Project Serpo, S-E-R-P-O, and is it legit or is it a hoax, as well as the supposed Reagan briefing on ET? The Reagan briefing, I don't know if that happened. I have been told by more than a few people that every president gets a UFO briefing, depending on, you know, what needs to be said at the time or what, what, the, what, the, uh, um, what the perspective of the government is at the time. Um, but the... Uh, what was the first part of the question? I'm sorry. This Project Serpo. Serpo, yeah. I will quickly explain what that was. Um, I believe it was in the mid 2000s, like between 2005 and 2010. Um, this guy started getting 
emails from somebody called Request Anonymous. Um, and what they were was a description of some of these where almost like close encounters, um, the uh, uh, an alien civilization had sent uh, four or five ambassadors and we sent like nine or something to their, their star system. It was an exchange. And that um, eventually some of them came, you know, all of them, but one came back. I think one of, or two, one decided to stay on the alien's planet and the other one died there. And the aliens all, all survived and went back. Anyway, this happened around a few people that were involved in the Project Beta stuff we talked about. And so my, my suspicious antenna went up immediately. It's like, well, there's the same people talking about this and the same people doing it. So maybe it's, <laughs> they're doing the same thing, which is basically some sort of project or, or um, uh, operation to, that had to be partially public. And what I always say about um, the episode and how I came to the idea that it was probably mostly or all a hoax or disinformation or whatever you want to call it, um, was that uh, Victor Martinez, who was this guy that was getting the e emails first, he was an English teacher and he would change the messages he was getting. He would change that. He would correct the English and the spelling and all that because they're all off. I mean, it wasn't perfect. So he was like, you know, of course, if you're an English teacher, like, oh, that's wrong. And um, whoever was sending him these messages, messages said, do not change what you don't change anything. You, you're supposed to send this. He was sending these UFOs to, I'm sorry, these messages to UFO researchers, like hundreds of them. I was on the list. I, I was on the email list for it. And I just started seeing these like incredible stories. But he was told, don't change anything in there. You can't change. Otherwise, we won't be sending these messages to you anymore. And either he couldn't help himself or I don't know what, but they, they stopped sending him to him and sent him, sent him to this other researcher, this Australian guy named Bill Ryan later. Um, and looking at that and talking to a few people, you know, if somebody doesn't want you to change a word of a message or even the punctuation or anything, it's a good indicator that there's something in that message that's trying to be communicated that is involved with those misspellings and the, and the punctuation problems and all that. And if that's the case, you know, somebody's trying to put, to put a message through and see if people can figure it out or they're sending messages publicly. And my idea about this um, was that the messages were put out to see who could figure out whatever those misspellings meant. And that if they could figure it out, those were people that the intelligence community needed to look needed to look at. And they'd start if they decoded the messages and they started talking about them. And it was, you know, we already had Internet and we already had email and all that. That chatter, the NSA could pick up or whoever and find out who had figured out this code and what was going on and why they were interested in all that. I mean, it's basically just to trap people that that they don't want looking at uh, secret programs. Um, I realize that's, you know, that because of my background and because of writing Project Beta, that, that that might not be wrong. And I'm just a hammer looking for a nail. But um, to me, um, since some of the same people were involved that were involved with Paul Benowitz, I figured there was another operation going on and that um, people shouldn't, you know, and this was with well, hindsight. This was right after it ended. Um, I wrote an essay called Serpo. Serpo was a big fat lie. And I explained why I thought so. I think it's in, um, it's actually in, um, it defies language as the, the, the text of that is in the book and, and a kind of an explanation of what happened, why I thought that and what happened afterwards. Okay. Uh, incidentally, we're just three minutes past the top of the hour and we'll be going uh, until the bottom of the hour. So for another 27 minutes, Elena <laughs> Campbell asks, what do you think is the solution for the chronic human miscommunications? Uh, between Miscommunications between us and the phenomenon? Um, I don't know if there's a solution to that. There's a, you know, a, I think these communications are for people individually and they have to figure out what those what they might mean for them individually. And like we were discussing before, I mean, we don't have a common language. So the language has to be in, you know, in symbol. Although people do say that they hear 
they hear um, entities speaking in English or whatever their native language is and communicating to them. And either it's, to me, as far as I can remember, it's either nonsensical, um, as, the, as our um, participant here says, or um, it's just, it's like, <laughs> it's almost like the UFO uh, entities are presenting us with koans and we have to go figure it out for ourselves and that we have to um, come up for those, with these meanings uh, ourselves. And I think if you do have these messages coming to you, that if they make sense to you and you feel okay about them, then that's the proper message. If they don't make sense to you and they make you extremely upset, maybe that's not what the message is. Because I don't think the, the, the UFO thing is here to scare us or anything like that. That's not its intention. Its intention, if it has one, which I think it does, if it has a teleology, it's let's communicate and see what happens because we want to know what's going on with you because you, you're completely alien to us. And we're there going, <laughs> we're there thinking, what's this weird thing that keeps bothering us every once in a while? Um, you know, if I had to reduce it to a metaphor, I guess that what, what it would be it would be like going to another country and having somebody try to ask you, you know, ask you, asking somebody how to get to the bus stop and 10 minutes of uh, total miscommunication, but well-meaning uh, uh, intention ensues. So I think that, um, you know, in my best heart of hearts, and I'm not, I don't like being scared. I think being scared garbles a message. Being happy and loving, I think, clears up a message. And whether it's right or wrong, at least at least it moves you forward rather than stopping you and making you afraid. So, um, you know, in general, answer to that question: if it if it feels good, then that's the meaning. Duran Jensen uh, is very interested in your tarot cards. Uh, indicates that he or she has been reading tarot for forty years, and uh, would like you to talk a little bit more about. Uh, your interest in tarot and its connection to UFOs. Okay, I'll try to be succinct with this because it's a um, it's a big subject for me. I was became interested in tarot by being a member of the Builders of the Aditum, which is a occult group in LA in the '90s. I was in that group for maybe two years. Achieved you know the first grade of um, of uh, uh, neophyte or whatever status, and um, is at that point I learned about the tarot and learned about Western occultism and all the stuff that derives from the Golden Dawn and all their offshoots and everything that came after. Um, and then, of course, before that. Um, what interests me about the tarot is, and I'm sure you know this, is that it is a representation, at least for the Western mind, of every type and every situation that you could possibly encounter. Um, across the, the card uh, uh, set. And it's, you know, to, you know it's, like, it's like a Western I Ching. I mean, you, you're gonna put what you want onto it and the meaning comes from you from the juxtaposition of these cards and the reader and the person that's asking the question, all these things. But ultimately what it is, is self-examination. And the important part of self-examination to me in the UFO thing is that you must know, as I said before, you must know your motivation. You must know why you're interested in what you're interested in. So four or five years ago, I was just kind of sitting down and doing some study and it popped into my mind. What if you mixed ufology with the tarot, tarot cards? And there it sat for four or five years until um, this group I formed online we were discussing what, what project me, what we might want to do. And I said, well, I did have an idea for a tarot card set having to do with UFOs and everybody in the group, all there's five in the group, all four others. It was like somebody plugged in a, <laughs> plugged in a power source because suddenly everybody went, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. So I knew we had to do it. Um, so what we decided was that we would at first do the major arcana, the 22 major arcana, and we would pick people that represented the archetypes in ufology for those cards. So the first person we did was Jacques Vallée for the magician, because we considered him to be, um, if anybody embodies the magician and the, 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 the wisdom the magician might have and the access the magician has to um, uh, changing the world to make it to make it work better for him or for other people, it would be Jacques, at least as far as UFOs are concerned. And, um, you know, and, and so for each figure, we would have, you know, the person on there, but 
Everything in the card has to do with their personality. We've even asked people what their favorite plants were, if they had a pet. And we put those pieces of their personality into those cards as well as their work. Um, uh, for instance, you know, Jenny Randalls, she's a, a UFO researcher and writer. Um, that's another one. If whoever's ever was asking about the books, anything by Jenny Randall's mind monsters is wonderful. Um, but, you know, we asked her, she's one of the few people, we've got three, three living people on the cards. We pro mostly deal with people that have passed away because it's easier because, for permission and all that. But we asked uh, uh, Jenny Randall's to be the high priestess. And she said, okay. And then we started asking her, you know, what's your favorite flower? She goes, well, it's a rose. And it's also the symbol of the, the uh, uh, you know, the district I was born in, 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 in England. You know, and she likes cats. So we actually put a tiny little uh, pin on her of a Manx cat because she likes Manx cats. So it's a little black Manx cat on her, on her lapel. Um, and we've taken the writer Wait Smith deck, and which is the one most people know, and kind of shoehorned it into what we want it to mean. Um, so uh, the hierophant is Stan is Stan Friedman because he was a teacher, uh, and at least that's he fulfilled that that role in uh, in, in ufology. Um, and that, you know, when you, if you use the cards the way, you know, the way most people use them, which is to, you know, lay them out and then shuffle them and do a spread, you will start to see not only, you know, the history of ufology, which is in, encoded in those cards. And we have a book that goes with it. If you, if you ordered it, you will see not only the history of those cards, but how that person changed the ufological landscape. Um, what their motivations were, and what's what was important to them, or what is important to them in the case of the people that are still living, and in that way that you can you can start to see what your motivations might be, and even if you if it doesn't give you any answers, at least you have a really good you start to get a really good encyclopedic knowledge of the uh, uh, history of ufology. Um, the other thing I've called it, we've all called it, is a. Uh, uh, is a is a very personal U, uh, UFO encyclopedia or book, um, just told in symbols and and images, um, and I think that that might uh, it, it's uh, it's going to affect people differently than just reading a book passively because the cards are interactive. That's one of the oldest interactive uh, systems there is, and that um, that. Uh, as people start to get familiar with them and do readings with them and all that, and read up on the people that might come up, you know. Why, why did Whitley Strieber come up as one of my cards when I asked some certain question? And then you can, you know, that way you can start looking up things that might be more interesting to you um, and have that personal connection. And apart from all that, it's just nice artwork. I mean, it's, uh, Miguel's doing incredible artwork. It's just, I, we've offered posters, which a few people have, have uh, ordered, but um, just as a gallery showing, it would be pretty amazing just to see all these things together, which we're kind of planning to do. We might have it in Los Angeles. But yeah, it's just, it's a contribution. It's a very opinionated contribution to the history of ufology. <laughs> very good. And uh, at the uh, end of the program, we can give out your um, website so that people know where to go for more information about that. Okay. Andre Slavash Krasowski asks, if you see any uh, differences between the taboos around UFOs and psychic phenomenon. Do these taboos differ in your mind or are they very similar? And he, he also wants to know about your opinion of the use of remote viewing to uh, explore uh, UFOs. Okay, well, the first part of that uh, was, I'm sorry, I only remember the, 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 my brain is going so fast, I drank too about much. About the taboos. Oh, are the taboos the same across between psychic uh, phenomena and UFOs? I think they come from the same place, which is a place of uncertainty. And if uh, people that are interested or 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 run their lives on certainty, um, and using uh, using a model where things don't fit, and if it doesn't fit, then it doesn't exist. That's where that comes from. There's, there's, there's no concrete model or, well, for psychic functioning, there is repeatability, but not the repeatability in the way that most, most scientists would like. Um, but yeah, I, I think those, those taboos 
as you call them, come from fear. It comes from fear of, of change and fear of the unknown and fear of not having an explanation for something, um, which is what science and, and the human mind is supposed to do is seek, seek out explanations and, and, uh, and seek out answers and all that. And the, you know, the, these things don't offer us these answers. It just offers, <laughs> they, these, these phenomena offer us what they are. They are what they are. And we and um, in our in our haste to explain them or put a meaning on them, I think that that's that's what causes that's what causes the taboos, as you say. Um, and the other part of the question was about the use of remote viewing to oh. explore uh, you the alien visitors and uh, yeah. UFOs. Uh, I've talked to my remote viewers about this, and they seem to be in agreement about it, which is. It's a wonderful tool, but don't, you know, you, you can't base it on any kind of reality that can be checked because you can't check the reality of it. Um, although Ingo Swan said that there were uh, uh, bases and other things on, on the other side of the moon and uh, other planets in the solar system, which can be checked out. But if it has been checked out, nobody said anything about it yet. But by and large, if somebody remote views something that can't be confirmed later, it's 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 useful as a, as an investigative tool, but I don't think, I don't know if it's useful as something to hang your hat on as a reality. Um, it's like, yeah, you know what I, I would, uh, my metaphor would be somebody uh, comes in and tells a police artist to sketch um, a, what a witness saw. So the witness tells them, and then they come up with a sketch that sort of looks like the person, but it's not exactly the person. So I think, you know, depending on how uh, accurate the remote viewer is individually, um, that you're getting little pieces of this picture, but you're not getting the whole picture um, because th there's no way for them to experience it firsthand either. They just experience it as a, as a feeling or whatever's going on when they're doing the RV session. And there's a related question from a, whose YouTube name is Do Me or Do Me. Do you, Ever have you ever looked into the links between magical practices, both modern and ancestral cultures, and the UFO or alien phenomena? Um, yeah, and I think it's as I said a little bit earlier, kind of um, I don't know about in passing, but I think the methods used for accessing something the uh, this ineffable non time space bound. Um, uh, dimension have been used for thousands of years and those can still be used now um, to find out about something as ineffable of where, as where UFOs come from. Um, and I think if you do find that out, that it will be very important for the individual or the group that is doing it, but may not be relevant to people outside of it. I mean, it could be, but that's my idea of why uh, you um, UFO groups should, large UFO groups should be done away with, and all UFO research should be done by individuals and small groups. Um, that, that's part of that democratic thing too, because then you get so many more points of view in the mix. And that's what the internet is for, is to share all that information. Um, almost like the scientific community does or the academic community, uh, you know, absolute openness, absolute um, uh, transparency about where you get your information and sharing it with everybody. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that, that's, I think, I think that's how things should move forward. And it sort of is right now the, the, the big groups are sort of, there's only one left really move on. Um, but there's so much variety within that organization too, that it's, you know, it's not hopeless. Um, but yeah, group, group think is probably the biggest, uh, uh, enemy to understanding the UFO problem and, and psychic phenomena and all that stuff. It, it has to be done, you know, and they, they all have different, you know, cryptozoology has its own issues, ufology has its own issues, and, and parapsychology has its own issues that they, they deal with individually. But, you know, collectively, yes, we're dealing with something that we don't have an explanation for yet. Um, we, we might someday, we probably will someday, but um, for right now, um, cross-pollination and keeping an open mind is probably the best uh, way forward. Here's a wonderful question from Red Pill Junkie. Yes. Which famous historical UFO event would you like to have witnessed firsthand? 
That's a great question. Uh, God, there's a few of them. Um, oh, you know what? I was going to say something. I was going to say um, um, Socorro, uh, you know, Lonnie Zamora, or um, Pascagoula with um, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker. Um, but thinking about it, you know, the one I'd want to see was the Papua New Guinea case from the 19, I think, late 50s, the Father Gill case where something was appeared over this beach and it looked like a platform and it had beings or some like humanoid standing on top of it. And they were waving, they were waving their arms and they were mimicking actually. The, the, uh, the priest went outside with one of the, uh, with the New Guineans and they, they looked at this thing and they started waving and the things would, they would wave one hand and the th one of the things the beings on the, on the top of the platform would wave its hand. They put both hands in the air and wave them. And then one of the beings would wave both hands, mimicry. Um, and, uh, it was probably 500 feet off the ground and they could see everything fairly clearly. And it was at dusk or just after dark. And it, they said it glowed yellow, I think, but it basically looked like a platform with a railing and these, whatever they were, humanoid beings were standing on it and apparently doing some kind of work to it. Um, and, uh, actually Valet told me something interesting about it, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, and and uh, maybe a clue to something. He said that before the thing appeared in the sky, before they ran out to look, he said, uh, I think an hour or maybe a few minutes beforehand, there was a knock on the door of where these people were and they went to answer the door and there was nobody there. <laughs> I don't know if that's relevant, but I think it's very interesting that, um, uh, that that happened. And also it kind of points up that when you do look at these things, it's probably good to, um, a researcher should ask what happened before, what happened after, how did it change you? Was anything unusual happening at the time? You know, like, did your mother just die? You know, connection to the dead. Um, you know, do, did people, did you or people around you become, start having poltergeist phenomena or psychic phenomena occurring around you? Because this happens often, but researchers don't often ask that. They just want to know what the person saw and how big it was and how fast it was going, what color it was and all that. They don't ask these other questions around it. And I think if you dig, dig further into a lot of these cases, including New Guinea, that um, these details would come out, which are uh, uh, would make the information richer and uh, might point, point us in a direction of trying to figure out, you know, what, what, the, what the UFO thing might be and how individualistic it is and all that. Um, th these seemingly... Uh, 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 unimportant uh, details. I, th I think they're quite important. I've got a question here from Derek Wyatt, who asks, do you believe that the phenomenon has always been a part of our world, our human world, and ha has it evolved with us and our ever-evolving consciousness? Yeah, I'd say yes. I totally agree with that. It's been with us for a long time. It's just, you know, as, as Valet says in Passport to Magonia, it's been here forever. And it's just every era, every culture puts their own imprint on it in the way that they think makes sense to them. Um, be it, you know, a manifestation of, of God or uh, a, um, a, a communication from ancestors or something like that. It's, it, it has been with us forever. It will probably always be with us. And yeah, we, we put our own stamp on it, depending on, on uh, what kind of people you are and how we deal with it and how we, how we make sense of it. Um, and the way we make, we make sense of it now, at least as a culture, is structured craft coming from other planets. Um, and I don't 100% agree with that. It's just a possibility, as I said, on the spectrum of, of, of uh, explanations. Mm -hmm. And I've got a question. I normally hesitate to ask specific questions. People ask about this person in that case. And I figure you, you may have no idea, but here's a question from Suzanne Taylor. And she's asking about a new movie called Aerial Phenomenon. She mentions it costs $20 to stream. Do you know about it? And she wants to know, is it worth the cost? I haven't seen it yet, so I can't recommend it. Um, I've heard wonderful things from lots of people that I trust that it's that that it's uh, worthwhile and worth the twenty dollars. 
and I'm, you know, I will, I will probably watch it myself. It's just, I, I don't consume too much UFO media for some reason. It's probably because most of the time I watch it and I go, yeah, I already know that. Um, but I think it's getting to the point with aerial phenomenon and some of James Fox's stuff that, uh, some of these things there's there's new information and there's there's things in there that that everybody can hook into from somebody for that knows nothing about it to somebody that's been into this for many years um and like i said i've heard uh nothing but good things about aerial phenomenon so i i, I would recommend it uh, sight unseen just because my people i trust said that they liked it okay and we're getting close to the bottom of the hour but oh, i've got a question from William Ritaco, who says he's heard Dr. Diana Pasuka Walsh mm -hmm. mention that she thought of Chris Bledsoe, who I know is a UFO experiencer, in the same way as Paul Benowitz, the person you wrote of extensively. Uh, it'd take a long time to explain to our viewers what is even meant by that, but uh, William would like to know if you agree with that. Um, I think sort of to some extent, but I th also think that um, uh, Bledsoe does have his own mind and does, you know, is, isn't completely controlled by, you know, whoever is coming to him from the government or private entities or whatever to uh, um, see what's going on, suggest him what might be going on, find out what's going on around him. He does have phenomena appearing around him. And I, I, uh, I think that uh, it's not so contaminated at this point by what people were telling him to think as opposed to what he thinks and what, what, what has happened to him. Um, and so the pure phenomenon itself, what, whatever's happening around him with uh, um, entities and, and uh, orbs flying around, I think that's, that's divorced from any meaning somebody might want to put on it. And he's decided to put a, a religious meaning on it, a Christian religious meaning, um, which is fine. I mean, it just, it strengthens his faith. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would agree with her, but also, uh, you know, he's not to a place where he's paranoid about everything and, yelling about the aliens being here and all that other stuff. He's, he's got his, Benowitz, and Benowitz was. Um, Chris Bledsoe has come to a, a place for him of peace with what's going on with him. So now if people wanted to uh, learn more about Chris Bledsoe, I've heard about him, but I'm not aware of any um, media or books that talk about this case. I've only heard from personal contact. Yeah, well, me too. I don't think anything has been written about him. Uh, well, plenty has been written about him, but not a book. Um, just online sources is probably good. You can see his videos he posts of orbs flying over his uh, his property, which I don't think are Chinese lanterns or anything like that. I guess they could be once in a while, but some of them do things that are very un-balloon lantern, airplane, helicopter-like. Um, and people like John Alexander and... Uh, 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 my friend Mike Clellan, they've all been to his property and witnessed these things for themselves. Yeah. So most of the information about him is 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 online. His son um, has a, uh, a, a podcast called Bled So Said So, where there's, um, I think they've interviewed him multiple times. So you could go to that one too. Okay, well, uh, we have just two minutes left, Greg. So uh, this would be a good time for you to let our viewers know about your radio program and your website. Okay, yeah, I have a show I've been doing since, actually since probably 1998 uh, in different guises. But right now it's a podcast. It's called Radio Mysterioso, R-A-D-I-O-M-I-S-T-E-R-I-O-S-O. -S -S it's spelled like Spanish, Misterioso. Um, that's one word, RadioMisterioso.com has interviews going back about 15 years, some, some a little longer. And you can talk, contact me through that. Or um, there's a Facebook page for Radio Mysterioso, which you can join. And you can also DM me on uh, Facebook. And there's also, or, or Twitter, uh, under Radio, Mysterio, Radio Mysterioso. And then the books, uh, which we've discussed, are um, Project Beta, A is for Adamski, uh, and uh, it defies language, 
Um, also wake up down there, which is the first book I did, which was a, um, or it was a collection of articles from my magazine, the excluded middle, which ran through the 1990s. So that's also a good primer, I guess. And you know what I'm interested in. It was like going through another college course for me doing that magazine. It was wonderful. Okay. And uh, I'll just let our viewers know that uh, New Thinking Aloud publishes a weekly newsletter. You can subscribe for free by going to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, which is New Thinking Aloud, all one word, and aloud, A-L-L-O-W-E-D, dot O-R-G. That's our foundation. And you can subscribe there to our weekly newsletter, no charge. Uh, and of course, our website is uh, newthinkingaloud.com. So uh, it's been a great pleasure to be with you, Greg. And uh, we've completed our allotted time. So I will sign off now and uh, end the live stream.